Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 484, Hysterectomy, What Do You Need to Know? BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Moffin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moffin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. So Dr. Moffin, hysterectomy is in terms of physiological health, it's a woman's issue. I mean, obviously men are involved and men are impacted if, if there has to be one, mm-hmm. but it's just a word to me. So I would like for you to spend some time talking about what is a hysterectomy? Mm-hmm. How does it work to have one? Uh, what, what kinds are there? Wh- whatever mm-hmm. that in case someone should ask me about it, mm-hmm. I would be able to answer their questions. It's interesting that many people have a hysterectomy, but they don't really know what they had. They, okay. And, they, and even afterwards, they're like, well, I don't, I'm not sure what they took out. Yeah. So, so the word hysterectomy means removal of the womb. So the uterus is being removed. It has nothing to do with ovaries. It has, and it doesn't always have to do with taking your cervix out. So the uterus is kind of an upside down pair, and the top of the pair now is down, and that's the cervix. So, so a hysterectomy means we remove the uterus. There are times when we remove the uterus and the cervix, as in if there's a cervical disease, we need to remove the cerv- cervix along with the uterus. And there are times when we just leave the cervix because the patient wants it to be left or because the patient's healthy, they've never had a bad pap smear, and they want to have the support after surgery what, of what the cervix provides. So again, displaying my ignorance, what is the cervix? What is a pap smear? Yeah, good, I, good idea. Men don't, I, I, I hear that was words. I hear mm-hmm. women talking about, oh, I didn't go to do this. But I don't know what that means. So uh, the cervix is, a, it, it is the bottom of the womb. And when you're having a baby, it's what dilates. Okay, it gets so it's big. The, it's the opening and, of the bottom of the womb that the baby comes out of. Right. Okay. So it goes, the baby lives in the uterus, but it comes through the cervix into the vagina and then out into the world. Basically, okay. so when a gynecologist looks at a woman uh, to see her cervix, we put them in lithotomy, meaning legs up, and put a speculum in that opens up the cervix. So it's it looks like I should have just brought one. It, it basically opens up so that we can see the cervix. It looks like a button or a large button at the top of of the vagina. We so look, normally it's contracted or, or sealed normally shut. it's almost. Sh- completely shut except for a tiny little canal that goes up to the uterus. And that canal is so that when you have a period and you're premenopausally, you can bleed through that little tiny opening. Okay. And is that something that the sperm has to go through? Yes. And then on the other, the other direction, sperm has to go from the vagina through the cervix in, into the uterus and then to the tubes to meet the egg. Okay. Okay. So when we're taking out does that explain what a cervix is? Okay. For, for me, yeah. So uh, generally when we take uteruses out, or we used to, through an incision in the abdomen, a little tiny incision like a C-section incision, and uh, we can take out the uterus that way. We can take out the cervix that way with the uterus. We can also take out the ovaries. When we talk about ovaries being taken out, we call it a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, BSO. That's all you need to know is BSO. We're taking out both ovaries. So what's that second word? Sal- Salpingo, which means the tubes. So okay. the tubes are attached to the ovaries. So we take out the tubes, the ovaries, and the uterus. And that leaves nothing of the female reproductive organs in, in the abdomen anymore. So basically, if you were taking the cervix out, the cervix is attached directly to the vagina. So you have to cut around the cervix and take the uterus out. And then close it. So you kind of close it like a seam, the two sides together. Uh-huh. 
So when you're getting a pap smear or when you're having sex, there's no cervix at the top if you have the cervix removed. Right. So you can't see this. You can't see a cervix. It's gone. Now, if you leave the cervix, take out the uterus. You can take out the ovaries. You can and and the tubes, but leave the cervix. Then, when you're when a woman's getting a pap smear or having sex, she still has the cervix there. And you, if you had a so, so again, what, a, what is a pap smear? A pap smear is sorry. Uh, the <laughs> the cervix the cervix has um, a high risk of becoming cancerous. And it's usually, not always, due to a, um, a virus called HPV. So HPV is, is a sexually transmitted virus. It lives for years and, and works on those cervical cells and, and can cause cervical cancer. So when we do a pap smear, we're just doing a, a scraping, meaning we just use a brush and a um, looks like a tongue depressor to get some cells from the cervix, and we send them to pathology, and they look for cancer cells or precancer cells. Mm -hmm. So the pap smear is meant to find out if you have cervical cancer. We've In the last 20 years, we've added the um, HPV virus detection. Uh -huh. So we also add that, and that's a whole different kind of test. And that tells us conclusively whether there's any risk for cervical cancer. So taking the cervix out is optional. Yes, uh, usually, often it is. Usually. Sometimes it's, it's required medically. If the medically. cervix is abnormal, has, has pre-cancer in it, then it comes out. Okay. Does that affect sexual satisfaction at all for a woman if she's had her, her uh, ovaries out and her uterus out and her like, going down the line? Okay. So if your uterus is taken out, but your, but your cervix and your ovaries are still there, usually after surgery, there's no difference in, in your sex life. Okay, in, in terms of your satisfaction. In your satisfaction, orgasms. They are, they're that, that still... That's the word I was looking for. That's yeah. the word. They're, they're um, alive and well, and you still have the same kind of sexual response. Because the cervix is where all the feeling comes through. There's two, um, there's a ligament to, that go uh, from the pelvic wall to the cervix, and they carry nerves and they carry blood vessels. And so when we take the cervix and leave the cervix in, we take the uterus out above it and we leave all of those nerves and all of those vessels so that you can still have the same feeling as if when you have a cervical orgasm. There, there are different kinds of orgasms and cervical is one of them. Um, I, way back when, long before I, <clears throat> I started doing the, my hormone practice, I was, I was passing by and heard this woman on a talk show crying because she lost her orgasms with a hysterectomy. So it turns out that she didn't have her ovaries removed, so it wasn't hormonal. But she did have her cervix removed. So her personal orgasms were all cervical. They weren't clitoral. They weren't uh, vaginal They were or G-spot. They were all from the cervix, and she couldn't get another kind of orgasm. So she, in her mind... <laughs> That that doesn't happen very it's often, yeah. but but it does happen in her mind that the hysterectomy took it away. Well, she need we don't do hysterectomies for fun. Right. You have to have something wrong with your uterus to have a hysterectomy. You can have fibroids. You can have a thick lining. You can have pre-uterine uh, lining cancer called endometrial cancer, and basically you can have cervical cancer and remove the uterus and the cervix. For those reasons, ovarian cancer, we remove everything. So you have an option with the ovaries. You can, if they're healthy, you can leave them. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're, if one of them is unhealthy, you can take one, mm -hmm. or you can take them both. Right. So why would you, if if they were healthy, mm -hmm. why would you consider taking them out when you when you do uh, a hysterectomy? Well, a long time ago, guidelines from ACOG, American College of OBGYN, said that you should take out. Anybody who's having a hysterectomy for any reasons, ovaries, in when they're in their 40s. So it was a matter of Just age. like a clean sweep. Right, because they were trying to decrease the risk of ovarian cancer. Okay. Ovarian cancer is rare. It usually runs in families. It's not commonly just a cancer that pops up from nowhere. So they've changed some of their policies. It is an individual choice. So if you have no cancer, no ovarian cancer in your family, you need a hysterectomy, but the, it's about the uterus. The uterus is bleeding too much, or you have fibroids, or something uh, is wrong with your uterus itself. Then it's okay to be even menopausal and leave your ovaries in. So, but, but it, medically, is it this, is it similar at all to 
women who have family histories of breast cancer that decide, you know what, I want them taken out because I don't want the cancer risk. Okay, so on the would, other side... Would you say the same thing about if, ovaries if there's if, a family history? If you have a family history of ovarian cancer... Um, would be a consideration? You have to be... You can go one of two ways. You can choose to be ultrasounded every six months and look at your of, at your ovary, but there's a slight chance that they might miss it when it becomes cancerous. Right. Or you can have them removed. So those are the two options if you have a family history or like mother or sister or aunt, not grandmother. Yeah, it's got to be close uh, enough. It's got to be close enough. So um, when we're talking to people, we have to think of their family history. We have to think of their age. We have to think of their... Uh, whether they're menopausal or not, because you could be menopausal at 40. Okay. Uh, we think about um, what kind of surgery we're going to do. So say you don't want to have a scar. You can have a vaginal hysterectomy, meaning I can't even, sh I wouldn't even show this on, on the video. But basically we work through the vagina, grab the cervix, pull the uterus down. I mean, pull it all the way down through the vagina, start clamping. So there's no way to preserve your cervix if you're going to do that. Mm. If you want to have a no uh, incision hysterectomy, then the vaginal hysterectomy is good for no incisions, but it's not good for leaving your cervix. You have so to so then it. in terms of the analysis, and you're sitting with a patient and you're considering mm -hmm. the options, do you then ask them if they know whether or not they have cervical orgasms or clitoral orgasms and, and make them aware that should we do it this way, yep. if you have cervical ones, you'll lose those? Right. And so does that matter I did to that, you? I did that during the last 10 years that I practiced GYN. Okay. Because I didn't, before that, I wasn't trained with that. I had to learn it. Right. You know, as I started doing the anti-aging I learned more about orgasms and sexual response. Well, you told me we years ago about that. When, when we were talking about some of this mm -hmm. stuff that, that a lot of the male doctors that you worked with didn't have any understanding of the importance of that at all to no, a woman. and they still don't. And so they would dis be dismissive about, well, just take it because yeah. it's easier. It's an easier surgery. Right. Well, it's, not, you know, it's easier if you're doing a vaginal hysterectomy, but if you're doing an abdominal hysterectomy, truthfully, leaving the cervix in is easier. is easier and it's less risk of infection because you don't ever even get into the vagina, which is not a clean space. Okay. So you're always in a clean area, which is inside the abdomen. So it decreases your risk of infection. Okay. And it takes less time if you leave the cervix. So you're talking about three types of hysterectomies. One is vaginal. Yes. And what are the other two? And there is, and the abdominal, which is where you have an incision, like a C-section incision, um, the third type is laparoscopic. Laparoscopic hysterectomies still have the uterus still has to end up being removed through, through the vagina, but they use laparoscopes to basically uh, cut and tie and and um, staple down the sides of the where the uterus was, and then they they remove it from all of its underpinnings, and then they go below, and then they remove the the uterus and the cervix, and then they close the vagina. Just close it like a, just like Where this. the cervix was. Where the cervix was, there's kind of an, a round opening, but they just close. Stitch we, it shut. Stitch it shut. Okay. So there's no communication between the vagina and, and the uh, abdominal cavity. So. Um, I have one more thing. Yeah. Da Vinci hysterectomies are laparoscopic hysterectomies that are done by robots. So that your surgeon is in is is in a room look, looking at you, and the and just the nurses are in the room with you, but your sur your surgeon uh, Sur places could be in New York or Sweden or something. They could be. Wow. So that's that is also more like a laparoscopic hysterectomy. So the cervix goes with that usually. Yeah. Okay. Usually. So you mentioned a few minutes ago that one of the questions is is do you take out the ovaries? The other question is what happens to the hormones. Right. Uh, so okay. So, so if you're if you're premenopausal and your ov ovaries are normal, they're still making your estrogen and your testosterone and your progesterone. So, in general, I would you know choose to leave them and, if and they're still working. that all comes out of the ovaries, not out of the uterus at all. So, no, if you take the uterus, uterus doesn't make any hormones. Hormones are still going to be okay. So, if you're um, menopausal and your ovaries are healthy and you're having a hysterectomy, then they make very little 
testosterone and estrogen, the only benefit I could see uh, with leaving them after your menopausal is that when you have pellets like what we do, they last three to four months. And as soon as they're, with hysterectomy patients, as soon as they get close to the very end and they get to the last part of the, of the, the uh, absorption, absorption the process, the patient feels like they just dropped off a cliff because I have this issue. If I don't get my pellets on time, if I'm a few days late, boom, because I have nothing to back me up. My ovaries don't work So then what happens to you when you don't have those hormones? You go through different feeling, uh, physical things, emotional things? What, what? Well, that's, that's, that's why when we, we've learned not to take the ovaries out in everybody, especially if they're working. If, you're hist if you've had, hist uh, if you've had uh, menopause mm -hmm. then, and your ovaries need to come out, you're not going to really feel so much different because they're not doing much. Okay, they're not right. really, you're not going to so see a feel difference. Any changes. Because you already feel bad because right. you're in menopause, and then you remove your ovaries, it's just going to take away that tiny little bit of estrogen and, and testosterone that, and, yeah. that you were getting. So basically, not much different. But if you, you have normal hormones and then they take your ovaries out, which should be done for endometriosis, that's the only cure of endometriosis is take the ovaries out, take the uterus out. You could leave the cervix, but if you take those out, then no more pain, no more bleeding, uh, and the ovaries are the evil person, ev evil organ, yeah. because they are the ones that are going up and down and causing the endometriosis to really be severe and cause scarring on the inside of your abdomen. So these are the those are options and different diagnoses. There are other things that determine what. I mean, this isn't just like an algorithm. It's basically more complicated than that. Yeah. Say I have somebody with um, a uterus up to their belly button. It's really big. And they come in, and I used to have people go, well, I want it through the laparoscope. Well, I can't take a 20-week size uterus out through the laparoscope because laparoscope goes through your belly button right where that uterus still is. There's no way to, to see it. You have to, you know, usually the laparoscope has to be this far away from what you're operating on. So it's really, I mean, you're looking through a little tube. That's where your camera is. So the laparoscope is, you're looking at a camera and you're working with chopsticks, basically. Wow. So through tiny little holes. Yeah. So we're doing the work there, basically through, through that. But if you've got a big mass, I can't pull my camera back enough to see it to, to operate. So if you have a big uterus, you're just not qualified for laparoscopic. Right. Plus, it may not even come out through the vagina that way because yeah. it's so big. So uh, we used to... You can't cut it up? We used to cut it up and then... Little pieces of uterus was floating around, and sometimes you never know what that's going to do with uh, in, in the abdomen. Yeah. So basically what we started doing is saying you, you just have to have an incision. I mean, yeah. now that's not everybody. There's a few people that will do this with a da Vinci, but if it were me, I would rather have an incision than have them try to do that because the da Vinci will take six hours under anesthesia, whereas a, even with a big uterus, it might take two hours. So you have to think of anesthesia time, too. Da Vinci's take the most. Laparoscopic hiss can be as efficient as an incision, but not always. And if Depending you, on the skill of the surgeon? Yeah. Okay. And how many times they've done vaginal hysterectomies and right. uh, laparoscopic. So, so, the time, so all of this is going through your surgeon's mind. He knows all the things about you. He's noted all these things, or he should. And then if he gets down to ovaries and he says you know i don't really have an opinion about whether we should take your ovaries or not but if they're still working and they're not they don't have endometriosis i'd say keep them so question it your would, ovaries um, make your hormones your ovaries make your hormones but your ovaries also have your eggs right so what happens to your egg i mean obviously you take the uterus you can't get pregnant again because right. there's no place for it to to build itself right but you still have eggs still have eggs so what happens then so um, the anatomy of the, of the ovaries are that they're, uh, they're sitting inside your abdomen. There's nothing really around them. They're just kind of hanging there, hanging off a, a ligament and, um, and the fallopian tube. And they're sitting, the end of the fallopian tube sitting right next to the ovary so it can pick up an egg. Mm -hmm. When we do a hysterectomy, the fallopian tubes are gone. The ovaries can stay. Everything else is gone. And when the egg comes out of the ovary, it goes into the abdomen and it dissolves. Okay. 
basically. So they're not ever going to be functional. Nope. They're not. Well, they're functioning. They're making hormones, but they're not. They're not making. They're not going to cause a pregnancy. Right. Because there's no place for them to go, no and they're, to work. they're just going to dissolve, and they're tiny. So, so you could harvest them, though, and make them available if you can get a, a surrogate womb somewhere. Mm-hmm. That could be and, done. And some people do that. They, some, they do. That all dep- depends on, um, there's a test to see how many eggs you have left. You still have to be able to ovulate, right. how old you are. Um, whether your ovaries have a thick coating on them, ma- ma- making you a polycystic ovary patient. Um, if you have endometriosis, it makes it harder for it to implant anyway. So in vitro, it's dip more difficult. So you have one more barrier. You're harvesting eggs. Then you have to put them in a Petri dish. That, you know, yeah. It's done, but it's, it's really difficult. And it, it's mostly done Most in women will never... young, healthy women who had to have their uterus out for a reason. Yeah. You know, some, they were bleeding to death or they had fibroids or something like that. Yeah. So... That would be something, you know, that you have to kind of think about. Your doctor should help give you an opinion. But even if you ask them what they do for their wife, I, I'm not sure. I would follow that because, you know, my wife may not be ha- happily libido. She may not have a happy libido, and, she, and sex may not be a large part of their marriage. But if it is for you, keeping your ovaries while they're functioning keeps some testosterone going and keeps some estrogen going. So what if... If you just took out one ovary, would the hormone balance that you are used to having adjust itself? I mean, like, I, I've read that people who lose eyesight in one eye, the other eye will broaden Compensate. Its, yeah. The big word is compensate. Compensate. Thank you. If you take out one kidney, Does the, ovary the do other the... kidney, you know, is str- stressed more, but takes takes over. Okay. Um, we were, The human body is amazing, yeah. and so... The ovaries basically decide who's going to ovulate by who has the best egg that month. Okay, so they a whole lot of little eggs start being start be, um, filling with fluid, and you can see them on ultrasound. And then one egg becomes the dominant follicle, and all the others just go away. So that one egg is dominant, or two eggs if you're, you're going to have twins. And so the twins come out of the same fallopian tube, or the same ovary. The, if they're both? from one egg. And they and, and they divide, divides, right. then they come out of one ovary. If there's, they could come out of either ovary. Okay. I mean, or or one from each. One from each. Doesn't usually work that way, but I mean, you can't. I can't really tell. I don't do infertility enough to know. But the people that do ultrasounds, they would know. W- would be able to tell yeah. you how often that happens. Yeah. Um, so I don't. I don't want to make a statement on that one. Right. So anyway, if you have one ovary. That ovary is the only one that can have a dominant follicle. So it works every month. So it takes over for the two. Two is, you know, that's yeah, one extra. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then the $64,000 question becomes, especially in a hormone practice, mm-hmm. if you take both ovaries and the, hist- and, and the uterus, then a woman doesn't have any of her natural hormones that she needs. Mm-hmm. Do you replace them? I do. Your I mean, answer I is honestly yes. say that. If you want to be healthy the rest of your life, and you've had both of your ovaries removed, especially before before menopause, then you need to get your hormones back. The best, I think, the best way for post hysterectomy patients to get their hormones back is pellets, because right. you don't think about it every day. Come in three times a year, get your hormones, and then you're done. The biggest risk with with pellet, estrogen pellets is bleeding. You don't have that risk anymore. Well, and, and <laughs> so it's pe- easy. Pellets replicate the natural system I mean, because right. you, you get a reservoir in the body that's mm-hmm. an on-demand system and as your body needs the hormones it releases them right. the same way it did when you had ovaries similar but not exactly as good when you have ovaries your brain your pituitary and your ovary have a conversation all the time mm. so as they're going through this your cycles and ovulating then they're they're talking to each other and you, when you need more testosterone and more estrogen then they stimulate more testosterone and more estrogen. The pellets themselves don't have a hormonal communication with your brain. Right. They just increase when your uh, cardiac output or your pulse and your blood pressure, like when you're exercising or having sex, they more goes into your system. Okay. But if you're, um, if you're, if you, we have to keep the levels higher in people so that we can accommodate 
times of stress and times when you really need more testosterone, but it's but cardiac output's not going to do it. Right. So when we replace estrogen, we replace to a physiologic level, just like what you had when you were having a, um, a period, basically, a, a menses. But on testosterone, it doesn't work as well in terms of giving you enough, so we have to keep you at a higher level so that you can... You can't just go up and get what you need. You basically have to stay up here. You have here. to raise the baseline. Right. Okay. So, so that's why a lot of people don't get our dosing. Well, and final question it about works. that. Uh, how soon after a hysterectomy would you recommend that a woman start hormone replacements? So I, when I did hysterectomies, I put pellets in at the time of surgery. So oh, right they never, away. So they never, they never went feel through, that drop. They never had the drop. They never had anything. Okay. So we would put them in right away. They usually would last three months instead of four, but that's okay. Yeah. Then, then they would get their follow-up uh, pellets when uh, they came in for their follow-up visit. So uh, I've learned today that hysterectomy is a much more complicated thing than I ever understood it to be. But That's the, why it takes doctors. <laughs> that's why it takes doctors. Well, and, and in my experience, men just don't pay that much attention to that or they're not given that information. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just like, oh, she had to have a hysterectomy. Mm-hmm. What's that mean? Well, she can't have any more babies. That's and that's right. all they know. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's all we need to know. But uh, I'm curious, and I like to learn mm-hmm. these things. But the main thing that I'm learning then is that for a woman to live a healthy, functional life and have a healthy sex life beyond that period in her life, beyond, she needs her hormone replacement. Yeah, and beyond removing your ovaries or menopause. Or menopause, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, en- the end of the birth-giving cycles for whatever reason. That's right. All right. Well, hopefully everybody else will learn the same thing. And as always, thank you very much for listening. If you like this, please uh, look for our uh, channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Yeah, on YouTube. So it's Biobalance Health on YouTube. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.